Thank you. Um, hello, a good day to you, depending on where you join us today. And a heartfelt welcome to our panel, The Role of Choice Floor Rules in International Commercial Dispute Resolution. My name is Yin Zhao, Senior Legal Officer at the Hague Conference on Private International Law. As moderator of the panel, I would like to introduce you our dis distinguished speakers, Professor Judita Cordero Moss from Oslo University, Professor Richard Opong from California, Western School of Law, Professor Laura Gama from Pontifical Catholic University of Rio, and Professor Xu Guojian from Shanghai University of Political Science and Law, senior partner at SGLA Law Firm in Shanghai. Great to have you on this panel. Um, I'm sure this panel will greatly benefit from your extensive knowledge and practical experience. Um, in international commercial transactions, a choice law clause which select the law to govern the contract and claims relating to the contract is often considered or included in the contracts. So the purpose of such a clause is to reduce legal uncertainty by pros prospectively selecting a law to govern the agreement between the parties. So they facilitate settlements um, because they identify the law that will be applied to resolve any potential dispute. They will also reduce the time, uh, reduce the cost of dispute resolution. So the core of the choice of law clause is then um, party autonomy. So in our panel today, um, we will discuss the role of choice law clauses and the applicable law rules in the absence of choice law rules in international commercial contracts. So before this, uh, starting the panel, um, I would like to inform you um, and the audience that um, the participants that the HCCH has developed various instruments in this area, including the HCCH principles on choice law in international commercial contracts, which we often say or often call the HCCH principles. Um, a few words about the principles. Um, um, they are designed to promote party autonomy in international commercial contracts, more specifically endorsing the party's choice of law should be respected. So as such, the principles enhance predictability and legal certainty as to the law governing their contracts which are important elements in international commercial dispute resolution and the crucial conditions for effective cross-border trade and commerce. So in the meantime, the HCCH principles also set um, reasonable and um, well-defined boundaries to party autonomy, such as par um, public policy and overriding mandatory rules. As you heard from the name, the HCCH principles are soft law in nature, so they are not binding. Um, they serve as an inspiration for national or regional development or uh, modernization of law, as well as a reference for decision makers, such as judges or arbitrators, when interpreting uh, the parties' choice law agreement. So at this uh, codified conference, um, there are discussions already on the elements um, on the implementation of the HCCH principles. So um, now that the HCCH principles are playing roles in the modern modernization of choice floor rules in certain jurisdictions, um, I would like to invite our speakers to share any updates or um, any trend that you have observed or witnessed in your jurisdiction in relation to the choice floor rules in international commercial contracts. So now, may I invite Judita to share your views with us first, then followed by Laura, uh, Richard, and Guotian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to this conference. I'm thrilled to the idea of being able to suggest and discuss something in connection with the Hague principles. Now, the jurisdiction to which I belong is Norway. Uh, it's the northern countries. You could say it's uh, European law because uh, uh, most of the northern countries, not Norway, uh, 
are members of the European Union and uh, and uh, therefore have, uh, for example, the Rome One regulation in the field of contracts. Um, I'm going to say a few words about Norway, but actually mostly I would like to talk about international arbitration because I'm very active in international arbitration and I find uh, a very interesting development there as well. But when it comes to Norway, there is an increased interest in conflicts of laws and uh, there is a much more structured approach uh, earlier decisions uh, by the courts were taken on the basis of uh, uh, discretionary evaluation of the circumstances as a whole. And uh, uh, now there are there is, first of all, an increased number of uh, Supreme Court decisions, and they are all taking into consideration or applying the, 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 the traditional method of conflict of laws, uh, classifying the, the claim and uh, finding the uh, applicable conflict rule with the connecting factor and uh, and so on. So so what I can observe is a clear shift from a casuistic approach to an objective conflict laws uh, conflict of laws uh, approach. And actually, a similar approach or uh, or the, the 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 beginning of a similar approach, I think I can detect also is emerging somehow within international arbitration. And I'm talking about both commercial arbitration and investment arbitration, although of course there are important differences there. Um, there is a, an increased attention to the enforceability of the award. So the arbitral tribunals are much more concerned with rendering an award that is enforceable, enforceable by the courts, which means that the courts will have the possibility to exercise a certain control, which means that the arbitral uh, tribunals are uh, getting more concerned with rendering awards that uh, would qualify for enforcement. And that uh, suggests uh, paying attention to criteria about uh, choice of law, among other things. Although, uh, in international arbitration, the tradition is uh, that uh, party autonomy is considered to be uh, sovereign, completely unfettered, no limitations at all, uh, and so on. So the, the, the enforceability is one, uh, the, the concern with enforceability, increased concern with enforceability is one uh, trend that I'm seeing emerging. And the other one is, uh, in respect of accountability, particularly investment arbitration, but also commercial arbitration uh, is more and more concerned with uh, accuracy, with uh, not giving the impression that arbitration is being used as a means to evade fundamental policies. And we can see that, for example, in connection with corruption. French courts, which are traditionally the courts that mostly uh, consider arbitration as delocalized, not subject to any national laws and only subject to the will of the parties and so on. They, the French courts, they have shifted quite remarkably in the last years towards an, a, a, a concern with being uh, accountable, with being accurate, with not uh, contributing, uh, arbitration should not contribute to uh, uh, evasion of uh, fundamental principles, for example, on corruption and economic uh, uh, criminality. So these are, I think, the uh, the trends that I am uh, detecting both in the in the Nordic countries and in international arbitration, an increased interest in uh, um, the the limits to party autonomy uh, in the interest of. Uh, uh, enforceability and accountability. I think I will stop here, but we I will come back uh, later to these particular points. Thank you. If I may, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ning and uh, the HCCH for the opportunity to participate in the exciting conference on the Hague Principles. Now, uh, we all know that uh, one of the main purposes of the Hague Principles, as stated in its preamble, is to be used as a model, a legislative model, 
for national, regional, supranational, and international instruments. In South America, we all know also that uh, since uh, 2015, Paraguay has a modern law on the choice of law rules in international commercial contracts, which took direct inspiration from the Hague Principles. Not only does it deal with matters addressed in the principles, but goes beyond them to establish rules determining the law applicable in the absence of choice by the parties. Now, there's fresher news also in South America. The new Uruguayan Private International Law Act enacted in December 2020, which does away with the country's historical resistance to party autonomy in international commercial contracts. The new law expressly allows parties to choose even non-state law to regulate their international commercial contracts. And more importantly, Article 45 of this new act allows, recognizes uh, uh, that parties may choose the application of rules of law that are generally accepted as neutral and balanced and a balanced set of rules if they emanate from international organizations to which Uruguay is a party. This provision has drawn direct inspiration from Article 3 of the Hague Principles. Um, then in Argentina in 2015, uh, a new civil and commercial code was enacted, and with it, uh, a whole chapter on private international law. When it comes to contracts, parties are free to choose the law applicable to contracts, but such choice must be expressed and also uh, regard a state law. They do not allow for choosing a non-state law in international commercial uh, contracts. Brazil, my home jurisdiction, I would say is the ugly ducking in South America. Our private international law system still relies on rigid 19th century uh, rules, conflict rules. And in case of conflict, our private international law system directs the adjudicator to the application of the law of the country where the contract has been concluded. However, since the 90s, the widespread adoption of party autonomy worldwide began to slightly open the Brazilian legal system to accepting choice of law as a general principle of private international law. First, a few state uh, uh, court of appeal decisions, and subsequently, the 1996 Brazilian Arbitration Act acknowledged the party's freedom to determine the law governing their contracts. The current status of party autonomy in Brazil is somehow bifurcated because there's judicial acceptance of the party's freedom to choose the governing law by the Superior Court of Justice, the highest Brazilian court with jurisdiction over contractual matters, in spite of the long-standing restrictive language of Article 5, 9 of the law uh, of introduction to the norms of Brazilian law, which is our private international law uh, uh, system. And on the other hand, the legislative wide acceptation, acceptation of party autonomy in arbitration, which includes both domestic state law and non-state law. The absence of uh, clear legislative authorization to choose the law applicable in the judicial context, however, still creates uncertainty and increases transaction costs in commercial dealings involving Brazilian parties. Given the express and wide nature of party autonomy in the arbitral context, there is no reason not to align the judicial and the arbitral settings in Brazil. Despite the promotion, proposition of several reform bills over the last decades, no legislative initiative so far to modernize the Brazilian uh, private international law has uh, succeeded. So these are 
news that uh, come from South America. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to join this uh, conference. Um, I work on Commonwealth African countries. So we are looking at about 16 or 15 countries um, that I deal with. And in terms of uh, the field of choice of law in international commercial contracts, I think what I'll begin by noting is that uh, the field has remained relatively inactive both in terms of judicial decisions and legislation in the Commonwealth countries that I work on. And historically, this state of affairs is not anomalous. Um, historically, most of the cases that emanate from these Commonwealth African countries deal with the issues of jurisdiction and the enforcement of foreign judgments. So those are the two main areas uh, where you have a large concentration um, of cases. Regarding the Hague principles, um, no Commonwealth African country has yet enacted legislation based on or inspired by the principles. And again, from a historical perspective, um, this is not unusual um, because in the common law tradition, private international law um, is largely um, judge-made uh, law based on judicial decisions. They, are only, uh, they tend to be only a few legislation um, dealing with private international law issues. Despite the inactivity on the legislative and judicial front, um, I would say that there are several scholarly um, writings that have espoused the relevance of the Hague principles um, to the African context. And I will highlight um, only two. Um, the first one um, is an initiative that is going on at the Research Center for Private International Law in Emerging Countries, um, which is based at the University of um, Johannesburg in South Africa. And it is developing what it has labeled as the African principles on the law applicable to international commercial contracts. And those African principles are heavily um, influenced or inspired um, by the Hague principles. Um, professor Jan Nils, um, who is a professor at the University of Johannesburg and who was also part of the um, members of the working group which drafted the Hague principles is the one leading um, the project and he has actually published um, the African principles in the uniform law review um, if people want to assess it. Another interesting writing is by Justin Mesonepo. Um, he has demonstrated that the Hague principles can actually help refine the rules on party autonomy that is currently contained in the OHADA draft on the law um, of obligations. Um, in his view, the Hague principles can assist the organization for the harmonization of business law in Africa in developing its draft on the law of obligations. Although the Hague principles have not yet been adopted in legislation on the continent, I will note that the fundamental principle of party autonomy in choice of law that the principles embody is reflected in case law on the continent. Case law on the continent um, in the Commonwealth African countries widely accept the freedom of parties to choose the law applicable um, to their contract. There's however a noticeable trend which I would like to highlight towards ensuring that choice of law clauses are not used to internationalize contracts to which governments are parties. Um, thus, some African countries have enacted specific legislation to ensure that contracts, uh, certain government contracts are governed by only their national laws and not any other um, law, foreign law. So that is a significant limitation on the ability of parties to choose the law applicable to their contract. And I will cite four examples of this um, legislation. The first one is section 35 of Malawi's uh, Public Private Partnership Act 2022. And um, it was enacted in April um, this year. Section 35 provides that every PPP contract entered into under the act 
shall, unless otherwise agreed between the parties, be governed by the law of Malawi. So it leaves room for the parties to agree otherwise. But if you read um, the whole section, it goes through a complicated process of ministerial approval before you can deviate from um, this provision. So the starting point is that the law governing uh, private partnership agreements in Malawi should be the law of Malawi and nothing else. You have a similar provision in section 71.1 of Kenya's uh, Public-Private Partnership Act of 2021. It also makes it very clear that projects agreements under the act shall be governed by the laws of Kenya and any other law is void. Any, and any other law chosen by the parties um, shall be void. Ghana's um, uh, Public-Private Partnership Act section 62.1 also contains um, a similar provision. And I believe um, that given that this legislation often serves as a model for other African countries, uh, many African countries which enact similar legislation will also contain this um, significant limitation on choice of law. Um, the last legislation that I would like to mention is Tanzania's uh, Natural Wealth and Resources Permanent Sovereignty Act of 2017. Um, Section 11 of that act makes it very clear that disputes arising from the use of natural resources um, and wealth shall be adjudicate, adjudicated by judicial bodies established in Tanzania, and it shall be adjudicated in accordance with Tanzanian law. So it also makes it very clear that disputes concerning natural resource exploitation in Tanzania should also have as the applicable law, um, Tanzanian law. Um, this is um, the, the, the most significant limitation on party autonomy that has um, um, so far emerged. And it's very clear it emerged from the legislative front rather than through judicial um, decisions. Thank you. Professor Shi, you are on mute. Professor Shi, you are on mute. Yes. yes. Thank you, Ning, for giving me this opportunity to participate in this uh, meeting and your introduction on the HCCH principles on choice of law in international commercial contracts. Choice of law rule rules for international commercial contracts play an important role in international trade and a commercial disputes resolution. As a practicing lawyer, as well as an arbitrator specialized in international commercial arbitration, I often have to deal with law to be determined to apply to the disputes of international commercial contracts. Today, I would like to share with you the information on choice of law regime in international commercial contracts in Chinese law and practice. The most significant provision of law in this regard in China is Article 41 of the Law of the Application of Law for Foreign Related Civil Relations of the People's Republic of China, which came into effect 11 years ago on April 1st, 2011. This article reads, the parties concerned may choose the laws applicable to contracts by agreement. If the parties do not choose the laws at do not choose the laws at the actual residence of the party whose fulfillment of obligations can best reflect the characteristics of this contract or other laws which have the closest relation with this contract shall apply. From this 
provision, one may see the following three ways to determine the applicable laws for international commercial contracts in China. The first, party autonomy. Party autonomy is not only the primary principle of Chinese applicable law rules for international commercial contracts, but also a general and general rule and a principle of its private international law legislation. Parties, including enterprises and individual persons of different types of contracts, as well as management without cause and just enrichment and thoughts may choose the applicable laws to settle their disputes. As to the time when parties may make choice of a law for their disputes, in accordance with the opinion of the Supreme People's Court of China, which is regarded as having binding force to courts in China, parties may at the latest make their choice of laws or change of such laws prior to the closure of debate in the first instance. The laws chosen by parties do not need to have actual connections with the disputes to be governed by laws chosen by parties. In China, parties may choose laws of a state to be the applicable laws governing their contracts and the disputes arising out of the contracts. They may also choose the rules and the provisions of international conventions and the treaties, which are not binding upon China to be applicable laws of their contracts or contractual disputes. It is uh, worth mentioning here that Chinese law requires explicit choice of laws by parties. This means that so-called tacit choice of applicable laws is not recognized by Chinese law. The academic interpretation for this is that a tacit choice is not based on express and a clear agreement of parties. To recognize such a choice of law with ambiguity is in conflict with the spirit of party autonomy. Hongwa is in general excluded from Chinese private law legislation. This applies also to choice of law in international commercial contracts in China. Laws of a foreign state chosen by parties in China may not include its conflict of law rules. Party autonomy is subject to few restrictions in China. This will be a topic to be addressed later in this session. Therefore, I do not talk on this here. The second characteristic performance. In case parties to international commercial contracts have failed to choose the applicable laws, there are two possibilities for courts and arbitral tribunals to determine the applicable laws in accordance with the PRC conflict of law legislation. One of these two possibilities is the application of the laws at the habitual residence of the party whose fulfillment of obligations can best reflect the characteristics of this contract. One may see that the Chinese legislation of a private international law has accepted the so-called theory of a characteristic performance. The third, the best, the most significant relationship 
in accordance with the PRC, Private International Law Legislation, the second pos possible law to be applied to an international commercial contract in failure of parties' choice of applicable law is a law which has the closest relation with a contract. The above are my remarks on the choice of law rules for foreign related commercial contracts in China. Thank you. Thank you all for the interesting um, update and for the observations. Um, we hear from um, after development and the rule in, in Africa, in South America and in China. And we also hear from this development from different angles from the legislative side, from the litigation, from the arbitration. And it's very interesting. Thank you so much. I'm also very glad to hear that um, the HCCH principles are used as inspiration for uh, uh, different regions for law. And great, thank you. Um, now we, you know, from your uh, interventions, we all understand that the primary importance of party autonomy in international commercial contracts, uh, um, both at the stage of negotiating the contract um, and at the stage of dispute resolution. So in practice, we do have a do however see the enforceability issues of, of uh, parties or choice of law rules um, clauses, or more specifically, parties of choice of law clauses are not enforceable by courts or arbitrators. Uh, we have just heard Judita uh, briefly mention that. Uh, um, we, we, we have seen some cases, um, um, for example, um, this um, by invoking as also mentioned in the HCCH principles by invoking party uh, public policy or overriding mandatory rules of the forum, irrespective of the law chosen by the parties. So we have seen the cases, for example, in West Yakada uh, District Court. Um, uh, the court held that um, in a law agreement governed by Indonesian law and written only in English to be void for um, being in violation of the Indonesian legislative requirement that the Indonesian language be used in contracts in Indonesian parties. So we have seen those uh, cases like this. So um, further to such uh, language requirement, um, it would be very interesting to hear from you, uh, our speakers, about your views or observations um, where parties choice are not upheld or not enforceable by courts or arbitration tribunals um, in your jurisdiction, or because of your practical experience, or what do you suggest to your clients when preparing or drafting or negotiating the contracts when um, to put into consideration of the choice floor rules? So um, that's my next, uh, that's, that's my question. So may I suggest starting from, uh, um, uh, Professor Xu Guojian here, and then we will hear from Richard, uh, Lauro, and uh, Judita. Thank you. Thank you, Ning. Party autonomy in China is subject to few restrictions. Such uh, restrictions include, in particular, the following four situations. Firstly, parties may only choose applicable laws for their foreign related contracts or disputes where such choice is explicitly allowed and permitted by the laws of China. In other words, where the laws of China do not explicitly stipulate that the parties concerned may choose the laws applicable to foreign related civil and commercial relations. And the parties choose the applicable laws, courts in China shall determine that such choice shall be invalid. Secondly, choice of foreign laws and international treaties shall not be in violation of a public policy, as well as compulsory rules of laws and administrative regulations of China. Thirdly, 
certain kinds of contracts, which mainly dealing with foreign investments in China, as well as foreign related merge and acquisitions of companies in China shall be governed exclusive, exclusively by laws of China. For such commercial contracts, even they are foreign related, parties may not choose foreign laws as the applicable laws to govern them. Lastly, in order to better protect the rights and the interests of weak parties, such as consumers and employees, Chinese private international law also restricts parties' choice of laws for certain kinds of contracts, where special protection of weak parties are necessary. Having summarized the above mentioned four situations where party autonomy or concretely said the choice of foreign laws for civil and commercial contracts is restricted in the law and the practice in China. I would like to mention three current judgments where choice of law by parties has not been upheld. The first judgment was made by the Supreme People's Court of China on July 9, 2004. The appellant a, namely the plaintiff in the first instance of the case is a company registered in mainland China. While the first appellee, B, namely the defendant in the first instance is Bank of China, Hong Kong Limited. And the second appellee, C, who was also a defendant in the first instance is a company registered in mainland China. The dispute of this case is about a guarantee letter signed by the appellant A and issued to the lender in Hong Kong for a loan granted to the borrower in Hong Kong, in which Hong Kong law has been chosen as the applicable law. However, the law chosen by parties has not been upheld by the court for the reason that the guarantee here in the case is a so-called foreign related guarantee. In accordance with the laws of mainland China, such a foreign related guarantee is subject to the compulsory laws of mainland China regulating foreign related financial activities. Therefore, the Hong Kong law chosen by parties to govern the guarantee letter may not be upheld, upheld by the court. I need to explain further that Hong Kong's special administrative region, short form SAR, is a separate jurisdiction from mainland China. The second judgment was made by the People's Court of Shenzhen Qianhai Cooperation Zone on January 25th, 2021. The judgment deals with a dispute arising out of the contract of information and a consulting service on assisted reproduction technology, short form ART, ART signed by the plaintiff who is a Hong Kong citizen and the first defendant which is a company incorporated in Shenzhen mainland China, as well as the second defendant who is the an individual person with the Chinese nationality. The service of this contract is that a company in Georgia with the name of U Baby Medical and Fertility Center Incorporation, which is a Georgian cooperation partner of the two defendants in this case, provides ART services to the plaintiff. In the above mentioned ART service contract, parties have chosen Georgian law 
as the applicable law of the contract. However, the Chinese court has finally declared the invalidity of the choice of law clause in the contract on the reason that ART services touch on the general principles of Chinese law and the basic morality and ethics. The choice of Georgian law as applicable law for the contract is in violation of the public policy of China. The Chinese court has therefore declared the invalidity of the choice of law clause in the contract. The third judgment, which I would like to mention, is actually about the application of law decided by the court in failure of choice of law by the parties. The judgment was made by the Middle People's Court of Shenzhen City, Guangdong Province, on December 22nd, 2020. This judgment is dealing with the dispute of loan given by a Macau citizen to a mainland Chinese citizen who used the loan for gambling in Macau. In this Macau related loan relationship, no choice of law has been made by the parties. However, the land who was the plaintiff in the first instance and the appellant in this second instance argued that Macau law, Macau law shall be applied to deci decide the case. In accordance with Macau laws, gambling is allowed and a loan agreement for gambling fines is valid. The People's Court of Shenzhen first decided that Macau has the most significant relationship with the loan and the dispute, and therefore Macau law should be regarded as applicable law. However, the court further decided that the application of Macau law in this case would be in violation of the public policy of mainland China, where gambling is not allowed. Consequently, the application of Macau law, Macau law shall not be allowed. The law of the mainland China shall be applicable law for the dispute resolution. So as to your question, how I should give uh, suggestions to our clients, because I'm also a practicing lawyer and uh, in negotiating and drafting uh, a choice of law clause. I usually check with the conflict of laws rules of the relevant, relevant countries and I also make a list of uh, situations and the circumstances under which a choice of law by parties could be invalidated by a court or arbitral uh, tribunals. So ensure to make a right and a correct choice of law clause in the contract. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I indicated in my earlier presentation, there are very few cases in this area. Um, what usually happens is that choice of law in contract issues will come up when the court is deciding whether or not to exercise jurisdiction. So the choice of law clause is taken as one of the factors that the court considers in deciding whether or not the case should go ahead in the forum or the proceedings should be stayed in favor of a foreign forum. So indirectly, um, that gives effect or does not give effect to the choice of law clause depending on the outcome of the court's decision, um, but that's not a direct determination uh, of the enforceability of the choice of law clause. Nonetheless, the jurisprudence is very clear
that choice of law clauses are enforceable in Commonwealth African countries, and there's a significant amount of authority um, to that effect. So there's no dispute um, that choice of law clauses are enforceable in the Commonwealth African countries that I work with. The real issue, in my view, are the circumstances in which a court may refuse to enforce the choice of law clause. And here, I think the case law suggests that there are two main grounds on which the court may refuse to enforce a choice of law clause. Um, the recent cases have emphasized um, those two grounds, um, namely um, the ground of public policy. So if the choice of law clause, enforcement of the choice of law clause is contrary to public policy, um, the courts will not give effect to it. And secondly, um, you have the mandatory laws of the forum. Again, if the enforcement of the choice of law clause is against the mandatory laws of the forum, then the courts will not give effect to it. Um, I think there are two cases which are illustrative of the general trend towards enforcing choice of law clauses and these two limitations, um, which I would like to highlight. The first one is Delta Beverages Private Limited versus Blakely Investment Private Limited, which is a 2022 decision from the Zimbabwe Supreme Court. And in that case, the court held, and here I'm quoting, the court knows that the law chosen by the parties will generally be respected by the courts of the other country in the spirit of sanctity and freedom of contract. A caveat to this general approach is that matters of public policy and mandatory laws of that other country may take precedence over governing law clauses, such as in the areas of employment and exchange control regulations, which are in the category of directly applicable statutes that override the choice of law, unquote. The second decision is Hebe v. Miwe Insurance Limited, which is a decision from the South African High Court. It's a 2021 decision. And there again, the court held that the general rule is that parties in an agreement are free to elect a country whose law would apply to a contract, but doing so, but where doing so offends public policy, the South African law would carry the day. Okay. So these two decisions make it very clear that if a choice of law clause is against public policy or the mandatory laws of the forum, then that choice of law clause will not be given effect to. The difficulty with the decisions is that they tend not to define what constitutes public policy or what are the mandatory laws of the forum. So that gives rise to a level of uncertainty when it comes to advising parties as to whether or not the clause that they have put in their contract will be respected. So that is in terms of case law. From the perspective of legislation, there are a number of legislation in the Commonwealth African countries that I work on that also impose limitations on party autonomy. And an important feature of such legislation is that they tend to deal with only specific contracts. So unless the contract you're dealing with comes within the scope of that legislation, then it will not be affected by the legislation. They are unlike the cases which are of general application. The legislation applied to specific um, contracts. One type of legislation we tend to contain um, limitations on choice of law is the Electronic Transactions Act, which you have in a number of Commonwealth Af African countries. And they specifically limit party autonomy when it comes to consumer contracts. So when a consumer enters into an electronic contract with a commercial entity, it tends to be the case that you have a provision in the Electronic Transaction Act which says that the contract should be governed by the domestic law of the forum. Because usually the Electronic Transactions Act will provide consumers with a number of rights and um, 
the legislature has taken the position that you shouldn't be able to use a choice of law clause to avoid those rights which have been conferred on consumers. Another type of legislation is the one I recently mentioned dealing with public private partnership agreements between the government and private entities. And um, I've demonstrated earlier that there's a recent trend towards limiting um, the freedom of parties to choose the applicable law in respect of such contracts. You have other pieces of legislation dealing with natural resource exploitation and also model agreements which are used for um, such natural resource agreements. So for example, if you take the model agreement for various petroleum agreements which are entered into by the African countries which are endowed with um, um, oil resources, you will see that it makes it very clear um, that petroleum agreements should be governed by the law of the country. And sometimes they allow for rules of public international law to be applicable too. But generally the starting point is that the law of the forum should be the governing law. There are other areas where occasionally you see limitations being placed on um, party autonomy through legislation. So the field of intellectual property is one such area. And another area that I'm aware of relates to labor employment contracts. You also tend to have legislation um, that impose limitations on party autonomy. But as I indicated before, the legislation tend to be of specific application. Um, so unless you are dealing with a contract in those areas, you only have to be concerned about um, public policy and the mandatory laws of the forum. Um, you don't have to be concerned about the others. Thank you. Now, um, in, in Brazil, uh, unfortunately, I, I could find no case law about this uh, particular um, issue, but I can conceive of uh, a few situations where uh, party autonomy uh, or the party's choice of a foreign law uh, may be denied by a court or arbitral tribunal. Um, now, as, as uh, following uh, on, on the path uh, already uh, uh, mentioned by, by Richard, um, there are some areas such as consumer contracts, labor contracts, uh, contracts with uh, state entities such as uh, PPP contracts, concession contracts, or contracts that follow um, uh, a public uh, tendering uh, for the for the uh, um, purchase of goods or services by state or state entities. These are fields which are uh, normally uh, regulated. Uh, or strictly, more strictly regulated as to um, the party's uh, freedom to choose uh, the law applicable. So that uh, if the parties uh, choose a foreign law to govern these kind of transactions, they may be, uh, or they may see their, their choice uh, denied uh, eventually by a court or an arbitral tribunal. In general, I would say that uh, if the parties litigate before the courts, their choice of law may be found ineffective where first it relies on non-state law because our private international law system does not allow for uh, choosing uh, non-state law unless you are in an arbitral context. Second, uh, if it is an implicit choice of law, there's no strict, uh, there's no clear prohibition for an implicit choice of law. But as I said, um, as uh, the admission or the recognition of uh, party autonomy is just too recent and uh, it's basically a judicial uh, recognition, I, I would, uh, I would uh, believe that uh, the implicit choice of law is not yet, uh, uh, this kind of sophistication has not yet arrived at, at uh, the courts. And thirdly, uh, when uh, the choice of law contravenes uh, mandatory norms or the public policy of Brazil. And finally, 
where uh, the contract lacks an element that characterizes it as an international contract. On the other hand, in the arbitral context, the situations uh, where the party's choice of law is not held, in my view, will be fewer. And they would uh, 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 include, um, well, they, they would include those which I mentioned as regards uh, the law, uh, uh, where you have a restriction as to uh, applying a foreign law, namely consumer contracts, labor contracts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is because uh, in the arbitral context, as we all know, um, arbitrators are more deferential to party autonomy than courts. And the Brazilian Arbitration Act allows expressly uh, the parties to choose uh, the law governing the merits of their dispute, including non-state law. So in summary, this is the uh, uh, scenario in Brazil. And um, as uh, a lawyer, I would suggest uh, the parties who wish to um, contract out of uh, Brazilian law and choose a, a, governing, a foreign governing law for the contract to um, conclude as well an arbitration agreement so that uh, they can make sure that their uh, choice will be respected in the case of a dispute. Thank you very much. <clears throat> When it comes to Norway or the Nordic countries or uh, Europe, the, the Roman regulation, as I, as I say, it applies not directly in Norway, but, uh, but it is uh, uh, given a lot of attention. And uh, party autonomy is usually enforceable within its scope. And these words I will come back to in a minute, within its scope. This is actually what sometimes creates uh, difficulties. The limits that uh, that uh, are imposed on party autonomy are pretty much similar to those that we have, have heard uh, so far. Uh, in the other jurisdictions, uh, protection of the weaker party, overriding mandatory rules, public policy. Now, overriding mandatory rules, I think in Norway we can detect a quite disturbing trend towards being very ex expansive in interpreting what is an overriding mandatory rule. So, so we have examples where whole chunks of uh, a law are deemed to be in their uh, totality overriding mandatory, rather than having a specific rule that, uh, uh, that overrides the party autonomy. For example, the, the, there are whole chapters of the uh, maritime law code uh, there are uh, uh, statutes uh, within financial contracts uh, where the whole statute is uh, considered to be overriding mandatory. And, uh, and this is uh, a tendency that uh, does not correspond to the expectations of uh, how overriding mandatory rules uh, should be uh, defined because they should be defined in a very restrictive way under Rome 1. Um, when it comes to public policy, it is not the choice of law as such uh, that would be against public policy, but it may be the result of having applied a law that permits a certain conducts uh, if those conducts infringe fundamental principles. And uh, we have seen that uh, I have mentioned the French courts, for example, uh, that uh, have changed their attitude towards arbitration from accepting anything that the arbitral tribunal has decided as long as it corresponds to the will of the parties from that to being much more restrictive when the issues at stake are corruption or economic crime. But there again, it's not the choice of law as such that would be against public policy. It is possibly the fact that the award uh, gives effect to contracts of corruption. But there is, this other issue that I mentioned initially, the scope of party autonomy, that is uh, something that uh, uh, often is misunderstood and it's uh, perceived by the parties as a limitation to the party autonomy, whereas it's not 
an intervention by the court, but it is uh, simply that party autonomy has a scope that is usually contract law, possibly uh, tort in, uh, in some circumstances, but certainly party autonomy cannot decide, the parties cannot choose the law applicable to their legal capacity, they cannot choose the law applicable to corporate matters, they cannot choose the law applicable to property issues, protection of the creditors, insolvency, and so on. These are all issues that are non-contractual, and we know that party autonomy applies to contractual issues. So it's not a limitation of party autonomy, it's only a question that uh, party autonomy has a scope that, uh, that uh, is not uh, uh, eternal and, uh, and, uh, and has uh, some restrictions. But sometimes, particularly in arbitration, when there are complex uh, legal relationships, the parties are under the impression that by choosing a certain law, they have chosen the law that applies to all the issues that may arise in connection with their relationship. So if they have a contract, all the issues that are of contract law will, of course, be subject to the law that the parties have chosen. But if there are some property law issues or some company law issues or some issues of legal capacity, those issues will not be subject to the chosen law. And sometimes, particularly in arbitrations, in arbitration, the parties get very surprised when they find out that, what, we have chosen Swedish law? Why do we have to take into account uh, Polish law to find out whether the Polish party had the legal capacity or not? So uh, this is where, to my mind, uh, the attention is mostly uh, where the, the, the commentaries also to, to case law are mostly uh, uh, active. Uh, trying to find out what are the borders of party autonomy. I have three examples from uh, recent, very recent Norwegian Supreme Court uh, decisions that I will go through very, very, very quickly. Uh, well, one is not actually, it's the uh, Swedish, it's not the Norwegian, it's the Swedish uh, Court of Appeal, uh, which set aside an arbitral award, it's some years ago now, it set aside an arbitral award between a Norwegian and a Ukrainian country, uh, and the Ukraine actually, um, because the, 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 the contract was subject to Swedish law, because the parties had chosen Swedish law. Uh, the Ukraine, which was a party to, to the contract, had as a defense that uh, uh, the party who signed the contract did not represent it, did not have a legal capacity, was not capable of uh, binding the Ukraine. And uh, the arbitral tribunal, following what was uh, very fashionable until uh, recently, what was the, the generalized attitude until recently was that uh, the arbitral tribunal only chooses, uh, follows the, the will of the parties. So, so they applied Swedish law chosen by the parties to the issue of legal capacity. And uh, that award was uh, set aside by the Court of Appeal in uh, Sweden, because they said the issue of legal capacity is an issue that has to be decided by the law of each of the parties, of course. So, so that was not a restriction to party autonomy that we know that the party autonomy does not cover legal capacity, but to the parties it came as a surprise. The second, the case that I wanted to mention is a Norwegian Supreme Court decision. It's a question where a Norwegian debtor assigned to the bank as a security for the loan that it took up. It assigned to the bank uh, some uh, credits that it had. And, uh, and then the Norwegian debtor went into insolvency proceedings. And the question was whether these credits were part of the debtor's uh, estate under insolvency or whether they were uh, reserved for the, for the creditor, whether the, the creditor had the priority on those. And the question was a question of choice of law. The assignment had a clause choosing English law, but the assignment was a, a, a formation of a security, it was like a pledge, and this is a question of property law, and the choice of law does not cover questions of property law, so that uh, 
the debt was localized in uh, Norway, and therefore whether that assignment actually managed to create a security interest in favor of the creditor had to be decided under Norwegian law, in spite of the fact that the contract of assignment had a choice of law in favor of English law. And there again, this was not a situation where the choice of law was not upheld, because the contractual issues, they were subject to English law as chosen by the parties. But this aspect was not a contractual aspect. And the third uh, situation was also a recent Supreme Court decision uh, in Norwegian. Um, there was a complex uh, situation that I'm not going to explain. Uh, there was a contract uh, subject to a certain law, uh, the law of the Cayman Islands, I think. And uh, there was a board resolution of a company from a different country that was a condition precedent for entering into the contract. And the question was, has the contract come into force or not? And this is a question that has to be decided under the law chosen by the parties, but whether the board resolution was valid or not, that is a question of company law that has to be decided by the law of the company. So there again, there was this separability of the complex issues which led to applying the law chosen by the parties to the contractual issues, but the law applicable to the company to the issue of whether the board resolution was, uh, uh, was uh, valid or not. So in summary, uh, apart from overriding mandatory rules and public policy, there are no important uh, limits to the enforceability of uh, uh, of uh, party autonomy, but there is a lot of learning to do on what is the scope of party autonomy, which effect uh, does the party's choice have? And I will stop here, but I will come back in the next part uh, to this particular issue, because I think this is an area where the Hague Conference actually can uh, really do some very useful work. Thank you. Thank you so much, all. Um... A very interesting um, uh, 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 discussion. So I, I, I learned a lot, especially to hear all this scope of uh, party autonomy. We heard all of the limitations and uh, what is uh, um, um, uh, enforceability of uh, uh, party autonomy and through the differences concept. Um, now, uh, given the time uh, uh, limitation, I will only jump to the last questions. Um, that is, I would like to invite you to share your views on the future work of the HCCH um, in the area of applicable law in international contracts. So uh, in other words, which aspects of the applicable law use issues in international contracts? Do you see the need for the HCCH, for the HCCH or for the harmonization uh, of such law rules at the international level? And, that I open the floor for you. And uh, of course, this time I would like to uh, invite Richard first, then uh, followed by Judita, Guotian, and Laura. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think from my perspective, there are two uh, main areas or subjects that I will propose. Um, the first one is the law applicable in the absence of choice. Um, the current principles uh, deal with only um, party autonomy where the parties have actually chosen um, the law applicable. But so far, there's no international instrument that deals with the law um, applicable in the absence of choice. And countries have different approaches in terms of determining the applicable law where um, parties have not chosen the law directly. So some uniformity introduced from the level of the Hague Conference um, will be useful. The second area where I think uh, some work um, need to be done um, is the law applicable in electronic consumer contracts. Um, from my perspective, um, the law on party autonomy is based on certain assumptions, um, which um, in my view are not applicable when you are dealing with uh, electronic consumer contracts. For, for example, the issue of consent, which lies at the heart of party autonomy and the Hague principles, um, in my view, operate a little differently when you are dealing with electronic consumer contracts, because we all know how these contracts operate and whether or not 
that we are actually agreeing to the terms that we click on, including the choice of law clause, is it, very much disputed. Um, so a specific um, set of principles or model law tailored towards electronic consumer contracts um, will be very appropriate in my opinion. Those are my two areas. Thank you. So uh, I, I um, following up what I was saying earlier, uh, I would think that uh, the Hague conference uh, could make a very useful work uh, in relation to the scope of party autonomy. Uh, what is actually that uh, party autonomy covers that we know it's only the contractual uh, matters, but what happens with the other matters? Uh, what are uh, the uh, how can the applicable law be chosen uh, in uh, in the other issues that are not contractual? This would be one issue, and the other issue would be the overriding mandatory rules. Uh, now, the Hague principles, now they uh, refer to the regulation in the forum. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, something that works very well in uh, court litigation, but it does not work so well in arbitration because arbitration does not necessarily have a forum and because we know that uh, in arbitration uh, the private international law as such is a little bit frowned upon, it's not considered to be applicable, it's better to have the voie direct and uh, to uh, directly choose the applicable rules and so on and I think that uh, uh, the Hague principle, be, exactly because they are soft law and not uh, the, 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 the legislation of a specific country, they really do have the potential of becoming the preferred uh, instrument in arbitration. And as I said uh, at the beginning in arbitration, there is this emerging trend that uh, arbitral tribunals are getting more and more uh, concerned with rendering enforceable awards, with rendering awards that are not used to evade, escape uh, fundamental principles and policies and so on. But in arbitration, private international law has been excluded a little bit from the, from the public discourse. So private international law is not so interesting anymore. And especially not the private international law of a certain country. Therefore, the Hague principles as an instrument of soft law would be much more palatable, much more useful in arbitration uh, than uh, a uh, codification of the private international law. And this is also, uh, now I understand that uh, uh, a harmonization of existing principles regarding overriding mandatory rules and regarding choice of law in the areas that are not contractual. That is an immense work that is probably not possible. This is also the reason why the existing Hague principles, they made reference to the law of the forum for the overriding mandatory rules, because it was very difficult to, to find a rule that could be uh, agreed upon by everyone. So, or, or that was already existing in, uh, in the majority of the legal system. So my suggestion would be not uh, to try to only ascertain what is already a generally recognized principle in the world, because it may be very difficult to find some, some, something like that. My suggestion would be to embrace completely the idea that is, this is soft law. So do like, for example, the unit law principles have done, where they did not find a generally recognized principle, they have suggested what they call the best rules. They have, for example, in the battle of the forms, so there were many different approaches of, uh, in different jurisdictions. And then they decided, OK, we do not have the ambition of saying that this is a generally recognized principle, but we think that this is the best rule. So uh, this is the prerogative of a soft law uh, instrument. And I think if the Hague conference prepared enhanced these a Hague principles so that uh, they, ex they give some criteria for the applicable law 
for non-contractual issues, and uh, they give some criteria for how overriding mandatory rules uh, should be taken into consideration, I think that would be extremely useful and probably very well uh, received within the international arbitration business. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. As uh, to the suggestions to the works of uh, HCCH. Uh, first of all, I would like to say uh, that the Hague Conference has played a very important role in harmonizing and unifying international rules of uh, private law. And the rules and the principles unified by Hague Conference have been also very important inspirations for Chinese legislators to make a legislation in China. And as to the suggestions, I would like to mention that in the world now, there are many new types of commercial contracts or transactions. Uh, for instance, cross board of data and this there are not many international rules and each country is uh, trying uh, their best to do some to make some legislations if the Hague conference may uh, consider to work on this field it would be very important and uh, would be a big contribution to the international uh, rules uh, in this field, the cross board data of uh, or data of protection. And uh, the second suggestion I would like uh, uh, to, to make is uh, the point uh, which uh, Richard has. Uh, shared with us. I agree with Richard that the uh, application rules uh, in absence of choice of laws by parties and should be also better uh, harmonized and uh, unified. As my I mentioned before in my remarks to the uh, application of laws in the absence of a choice of laws by parties in China. And uh, we, the Chinese legislation has accepted the theory of so-called significant relationship as well as the characteristic performance. But on the international level and uh, countries uh, also have the demands to have some uh, model laws or principles or international legislations in this regard. So I think HCCH may also do works in this regard. Thank you. Well, um, everything has been uh, said already. I would just uh, underline uh, the importance of uh, developing uh, rules on the determination of the law applicable in the absence of choice and by the means of a soft law instrument. I think that uh, with this, uh, the HCCH principles uh, would become a more complete instrument regulating uh, the determination and not only the choice of the law governing international contracts. So this is my uh, uh, humble suggestion as to the future work of the Hague Conference. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Um, first, thank you very much for your interesting presentations. Um, uh, from your thought-provoking and uh, inspiring discussions, 
Um, we can briefly very summarize several key, away, key takeaway from these discussions. Um, no doubt, and first, no doubt that party autonomy plays an important role um, in international commercial contracts and national uh, law and regional law are, are in development in endorsing, um, endorsing the party autonomy. And, um, which is also in line with the HCCH principles. Uh, we also heard that the HCCH principles have played a role as inspiration uh, for such a development. Um, we also heard that the practice also pointing to the same direction. And we also heard today a very interesting discussion about uh, these limitations of the church law rules, um, uh, uh, the enforceability issues in for, uh, the church floor rules, and also importantly, that the overriding mandatory rules, as Richard uh, Judita had mentioned, they also raise the um, uh, uh, legal uncertainties as to uh, in practice. So, so what 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 in are considered uh, overriding mandatory rules. We also heard, for, uh, especially for arbitration committee, uh, community might be interesting. So um, we we also. Uh, I took note of all the discussion and the kind of suggestion that you have made. We heard that the, the law, um, the areas where harmonization at the international uh, at the international level will be needed, for example, um, uh, how to identify applicable law rules in the absence of choice, um, e-commerce or the weaker party protections, and, and the scope of party autonomy, um, and overriding mandatory rules and et cetera. So it is a very useful, um, we, we took uh, take stock, uh, take stock and uh, to, um, to continue uh, brainstorming on this issue. And we will be uh, bringing to some for, for international legal community, community and promote, promoting and enhancing international trade and investment. Um, thank you so much uh, again for, for your contribution and we genuinely enjoy the discussion. Uh, I also hope uh, that the participants have enjoyed the, dis uh, the, the, the panel discussion as much as I do. And um, again, uh, thank you very much, uh, the, the distinct, uh, distinguished speakers for your contribution. Um, we, we stay in touch and um, for that, I conclude the discussion for today. And thank you very much again.